Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. On this theme we have today is how to evaluate TID post stress and some pitfalls in the interpretation of SPECT and SPECT CT. So this is a patient I just got the uh, pleasure of seeing him in clinic about uh, four or five days ago. A 59 year old uh, male uh, came for uh, to be seen by one of my colleagues in the AP service for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He runs about three miles uh, almost daily with no symptoms. Uh, they're planning to put him on a class 1 AC medication for management of his atrial fibrillation, which bothers him uh, every time he's in atrial fibrillation, and therefore he was referred for a stress test. Now let's talk a little bit about first the wisdom of undergoing stress testing uh, prior uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, whether that's appropriate. Uh, these are the multimodality imaging uh, uh, appropriate use criteria that were published a few years ago, uh, looking at the uh, indication for atrial fibrillation. It gave it an indication of maybe appropriate. So it didn't say it is not appropriate. And at the same time, it did not say it's rarely appropriate. So these are the classifications. And if you want to see it in, a, in a, a table format, I'll show you in a bit. So uh, these are the, again, the steps we go about uh, reviewing a stress test. This is the uh, uh, appropriate uh, use criteria. And you can see here atrial fibrillation, uh, not for cardioversion, uh, but uh, for evaluation of these patients. Uh, it has a, a four, uh, which we may or may not disagree with uh, for spec, but uh, in general, uh, this is considered a, a, an intermediate indication. Uh, so the patient underwent a stress test. These are his uh, images. Uh, so uh, the stress test uh, due to the recent situation in stress testing was done uh, at a different facility. Uh, the patient, uh, uh, not at our hospital. Uh, so the patient presented uh, after my electrophysiology colleague called me and said, uh, do you mind looking at these images? So a uh, patient showed up to our lab. I basically took the CD and loaded it to, the, uh, to our uh, working station. So the first uh, thing I noticed is if you look at the, uh, at the images here, these are the stressed uh, AC images with the CT in it. Uh, you can see there is a misalignment of the heart with the, uh, on the perfusion images with the uh, CT images here on the left-hand side. And this is after I have manually realigned them and basically now allowed for appropriate co-registration of the perfusion and the uh, CT uh, images. So this is the uh, exercise uh, part of the stress test. So now we have rest on the bottom, stress in the middle, and this is the gated images. These basically are the raw images, which we review all the time to make sure uh, we uh, control for uh, motion, patient motion. Uh, extra cardiac activity, chest activity, and, uh, and basically QA for the stress test. So the patient during the stress test underwent uh, went up to nine METs with severe assurance of breath. So these are the uh, perfusion images now. This is a SPECT. Again, this is not a, uh, a, a PET. So you have the rest images on the bottom, the SPECT images on top. Uh, <clears throat> Again, you can see here uh, uh, the heart, uh, rest and stress. Uh, some little bit of a motion artifact here. You can see this uh, almost 11 o'clock and five o'clock artifact and rest images, which not present on the stress images. In general, the perfusion images here uh, look uh, quite, uh, quite okay. So then we go back to the, uh, we go forward, sorry, with the, to the uh, gated images. And you can see here, uh, uh, normal wall motion, normal uh, function uh, of the left ventricle, even the right ventricle, whatever you see of it here is uh, reflected as, as normal. So uh, some uh, dyssynchrony stuff that we do all the time, uh, this is the stress dyssynchrony, everything is all the ventricle, the ventricular segments uh, are contracting also at the same time. There is a bit of uh, uh, disorganized uh, a contraction at, at rest. Uh, we will uh, talk about this in a, in a few uh, minutes. Then we look at the CT images. Again, this patient had no coronary calcification. The long fields look okay on this uh, side here, uh, just again for to assess for coronary calcification and for uh, extracardiac uh, uh, findings. 
So this is what the report said. There were no perfusion defects. The patient had a TID. Uh, this is basically uh, ischemic dilatation from rest to stress of 1.47. Uh, normal rest and post-stress ejection fraction in a high-risk scan. This is the way the scan was read uh, at uh, this outside facility, and they said this may represent multi-vessel uh, disease. So this is the biggest uh, actually nightmare for anybody who reads these scan is to have a normal scan with the ID uh, where you can miss this thing called balanced ischemia. And uh, you know there is no uh, uh, way around it. Unfortunately, you have to look at a lot of other parameters. This patient did not have EKG changes. He went nine meds. Uh, so uh, you still can have uh, multi-vessel disease, but uh, uh, it's something we fear all as nuclear cardiology readers that we can miss this entity. And TID is one of the parameters we use to alert us to the presence of uh, possible multi-ischemic disease that we, uh, we have uh, missed. So uh, again, I go back to a couple of things uh, after that. So the patient came to my clinic. I asked for the... Uh, uh, a CD, the patient brought the CD with him. So now I go through exactly the same steps we've discussed in every single one of these uh, videos that uh, uh, are on our website, uh, cardiacimagingagora.com uh, and on our YouTube uh, platform. So I went through these things. So I reviewed most of these things with you uh, so far. So I, I go to this view here and I noticed right away that there is something uh, not right here. So these are the uh, in blue, you see the rest uh, images, uh, giving me an systolic volume of nine, which is very small, and diastolic volume of 34. And on the stress images, you can see this uh, here, and systolic volume of 14, and diastolic volume of 69. Uh, so we have an increase in ejection fraction from rest to stress, but still we have significant dilatation of the ventricle from rest to stress. So both n systolic and end diastolic things, uh, uh, volumes went up. And you can see this, this uh, disconnect between the volumes uh, right here, uh, very well represented. The next thing I, I always look at whenever I'm looking at these things is, as I've showed you from the prior laundry list we go through, is to look at the histogram of the acquisition. So these are the stress images on top and the rest images on bottom. So you can see here, these are this is the histogram of the rest uh, images. And what you have here, you have this white dispersion of the uh, uh, RR interval uh, with very high heart rate uh, at times, whereas during the stress images, we have a very stable heart rate representing a very narrow histogram and probably uh, a normal sinus rhythm. So again, what happened to this patient after I went back and looked at, uh, at this is the patient was in AFib uh, during the rest images, as you can see right here, with a very hard, uh, high uh, uh, heart rate. Uh, the patient was asked to stop his uh, uh, beta blockers on the day of the test. So uh, he went into AFib and between the rest and the stress images, he, uh, uh, for whatever reason, he end up having a post-exercise uh, uh, spontaneous cardioversion and now he's in normal sinus rhythm. So to explain this uh, a little bit, you have to understand uh, some of the uh, things that uh, go into reconstruction of these images. So again, you have to review the synchrony of this to the histogram to figure this out. Otherwise, just looking at the images alone, you might misconstrue this as it was, as transient ischemic dilatation of the left ventricle from rest to stress and representing multivessel ischemia. So how do we reconstruct the images? So we all know about the gated images, how they are reconstructed. Uh, so they, it depends on whether you're taking uh, a 16 uh, gated or 16 frames uh, per cardiac cycle or eight. At our center, we do 16, but this is a representation of the eight, which is traditionally seen in most textbooks. So it takes the heart from all the way from uh, diastole, again, run it through that cardiac cycle all the way to the uh, uh, diastole in the next cardiac cycle. And this represents a full cardiac cycle here. And it follows the, basically the thickening or the brightening of the ventricle as it goes through. So it uses the uh, partial volume effect of the left ventricle to create this brightening effect and then detect that. So we'll explain this in another video at one point, uh, but this is how the uh, gated images are constructed. Uh, the non-gated images is basically we're taking the cardiac cycle without any gating to the EKG, without any respect to what's happening in the EKG. Now the reason the image, the rest images, the perfusion images, rest and stress appear as if they're end diastolic images because physiologically, when your heart rate is about 60 or 70 or 80, 
your ventricle is spending most of its time in diastole and very little of its time in systole. So these are, they look like diastolic images, but these are all comers, systolic and diastolic images. Now, when you have a patient in atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, what's happening is the ventricle is almost always in systole. Diastole is very short period. And therefore the end systolic volume of the ventricle is extremely small as well as the end diastolic volume because the ventricle does not have time to relax and end up in end diastole as you have in uh, normal science rhythm. So the diastolic time period is extremely shortened and therefore the ventricle might appear extremely small as if it's always in systole. Now, when the patient converted to normal sinus rhythm here, what happened is we ran back to the old traditional thing where the ventricle is spending most of its time in diastole. And therefore, when we reconstructed the images, the perfusion images, it looked that the ventricle is bigger. So this is extremely important concept, especially when patients go from a certain rhythm at rest to a different rhythm during stress. Or if you decide in one set of the images to exclude a lot of PVCs, and the other set, you don't exclude them. So if you narrow your window a lot and exclude a lot of PVCs, you might have this difference from rest to stress in, uh, uh, in the size and shape of the left ventricle. So this is for the perfusion images side. This is, again, independent of the gated images. In the gated images, again, these images are gated for uh, all the way from end diastole to end diastole. So you might uh, get around this if you have a regular rhythm. Although on the... On the uh, 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 EF side, it might appear, uh, they might appear different from rest to stress. Again, important concept to remember. So uh, just to take uh, home messages, follow all the steps we talked about before in reading any stress test. Be aware of how the images are generated, how they're reconstructed, have a general idea how it's done. If you want an in-depth idea, read, read about it. Uh, trust what other people tell you, but verify it. So pull up the images yourself, if I had not get the C, uh, obtained the CD on this patient and loaded it again and viewed all the images, I would have uh, believed what uh, the still images have showed me, which is a, a TID, and then we would have ended up with a cardiac catheterization and all these uh, other downstream testing that are not necessary. Uh, with that, I thank you for uh, listening to this episode, and we'll see you very soon in another episode of uh, uh, Cardiac Imaging Agora. Thank you.